SCP-093 Green Test Mirror Test 2 Color Green Subject is D-54493 Female, 23 years of age, average physique Subject's background shows instance of Grand Theft Auto and second degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a green color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape, heavily tinged in green, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through video feed are deeper and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects similar to the blue tinge in test 1. No landmarks from test 1 are discernible as subject pans camera over area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design. Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field. Large, two stories, and a basement shelter entrance is visible at one end. Subject prepares her sidearm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she's fine, then proceeds as directed to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two. A boy's and a girl's lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass, torn from the entrance as evidenced by splintered wood. On the stairs lay clothes arranged in a descending order, shoes to shirt going down them, belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control, asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her that they have never seen this environment either, and to please calm down. Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-093 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. After several minutes, subject agrees to continue. Communication with subject is muted, and conversation of Control making commentary about subject's jittery attitude make up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication restored as subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from support beams. Camera is panned across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible on the ground, similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch, and the dirt over the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old and the paint chipped. Subject coerced into turning the handle, which, when fully turned, opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed old, stale air. When camera is tilted to view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel, similar to the one found in the blue experiment, but in much better condition. Subject asks to descend ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend, but does not close the hatch. Overlooked concerns about severing the pulley system in doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. The insides of the hatch appear to be a bunker, ill-suited to long-term usage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple and two for single use. Several boxes of food similar to those found during blue marked as cereal fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons, and on the floor is a third, lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. 
On the other side of the skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed into a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone per request from control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing and a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products are lined against the walls. Subject is requested to leave the bunker and then sharply asked to wait by a control technician who directs the camera view to an area near the existing doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection as subject moves in finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange, amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect a sample, commenting that it stinks so bad that if they want it, they can come get it themselves. Control declines, and Subject leaves Bunker. As Subject grips ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment, and at the top of the tunnel, a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks Subject to confirm Figure. Subject states nothing is up there and begins to climb. Figure draws out of camera view after first rung is touched by Subject, who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. Nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch, then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes, and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously with firearm drawn and lifts her head just enough so camera can view outside area. In the distance, approximately 700 meters from the farm, two massive humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject, who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle moving across the field of vision, so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time, it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out to varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings. All bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately 10 minutes to disappear into the distance before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar, and not to leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling or floor that opens with rusty creaks that cause subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering a kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open. All food is spoiled. Adjacent to the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. There is a recliner, a couch, and a television, all of 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop whose case also resembles 1950s decor and is coated in heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system, Faithful OS, leaving a standby mode and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source and will not power back on. When asked to recover laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together. Subject advised to leave laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks. No attempt made to interact with these. Camera view pans to a staircase leading upstairs. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked, and the stairs remain silent to control surprise. When the subject reaches top of stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side. At the end of the hall, a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. 
The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out on the bed several pieces of jewelry and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink and leaves them alone, promptly leaving room. Subject asks to open second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom. Obviously, boy and girl, given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window, which subject approaches and wipes with a curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible, and approximately 40 kilometers from it at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures, similar to those from the footage captured during Blue Test, are visible around the home, all staring up. Subject asks to confirm figures, but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Police system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point of pulley wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report they were also able to hear the noise and experienced the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation, and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 relinquished. Video ends. Returns newspaper fragments filed as th The next test is classified as the Violet Test. Mirror Test 3. Color, Violet. Subject is D84930. Male, 21 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of second degree murder of a police officer during a drug bust. Normally, this crime, while severe, would not qualify a person for a sentence that would end up with us. But the murder of the officer was especially brutal and excessive violence was used. This subject was uncooperative and had to be reminded that his cooperation would only benefit him. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a violet color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a cityscape, urban, lightly tinged in purple, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera flickers to life and pans around the area. Subject is in what appears to be a modern downtown district, similar to a city like New York. The streets are mostly bare except for a few cars of unknown make or model. These cars look highly advanced and streamlined. Subject attempts to look into the car windows without being instructed to, but backs away, remarking there's a rank stank coming from the areas around most of them. Subject is persuaded to move closer to one car and does so with coughing, wiping off a window which is covered in dirt. The inside of the car appears to be completely filled with a strange brown matter. There is nothing at all visible other than the brown matter. Two other cars produce the same results, however a fourth vehicle seems more recent than the others and the insides are immaculate. The doors to this vehicle also are unlocked and subject quickly gets inside then shuts the doors. Subject is chastised for this behavior by Control, who reminds him his lifeline is nothing more than a cable, which is sturdy enough that closing a car door does not injure it, but they cannot recover a person in motion. Subject argues with Control over this issue and pans the camera across the dashboard, pointing out he couldn't drive away even if he tried. The dashboard is void of any recognizable controls, no ignition, no steering, it has several small blank screens that are theorized to be a GPS system. Subject remains in the car while Control discusses how to proceed since the city landscape is far larger than the previous test destinations. Control debates this issue while Subject stares around the cityscape from the car. During one pan, a face is clearly seen staring into the car, eyes watching the subject. However, this was not noticed until post-test footage review. Subject made no comment regarding this entity at any point. 
control shortly after informs subject to remain where he is, and an escort team is dispatched through the mirror to join him. A team of four armed personnel is sent through the mirror and proceeds to subject's location. Subject is then instructed to remove his harness, which is recovered. This subject's video feed then ends and is replaced by a wireless unit used by the escort team. The video quality on this unit is subject to more interference, but in order to mark the mirror exit, a receiver system is placed through the mirror. Subject leaves the car and now travels with the escort team. Given the myriad of possible options, they are instructed to simply move to the closest building and attempt to enter it. This building has etched glass doors bearing the name XEA Research Partners Inc. and the doors are ajar. A magnetic lock system is present but has lost power. Team enters the building and main lobby. This area resembles a stereotypical corporate lobby. There is a C-shaped reception desk with a chair pushed far from it as if it was left in a hurry. A PC terminal is at the desk as well. Team approaches the desk and the camera bearer is instructed to examine the PC. The unit does appear to have power and Faithful OS appears to be on the screen, requesting a login and password. A keyboard is present but is remarkably slim with touch sensitive keys rather than press down keys. After one failed attempt, the lock screen replies that maximum attempts have been exceeded and the PC turns off. No actual tower or power button can be located, so team moves forward. Behind the receptionist's desk are two elevator doors, one to the left and one to the right, with similar touch sense keys. The elevator on the left is broken, the door open and the shaft empty. The elevator on the right appears functional and has power. Without a clear destination, the team is instructed to proceed to the highest floor to get a lay of the city. All floors appear to be accessible, with the highest being 114. In reality, 112, as 13 and 113 are missing from the keypad. Journey up the elevator is uneventful during this time. The elevator does appear to take longer as it passes by 13 and then 113, suggesting that entire floor was built and nothing put on it. At 114, the doors open and team enters a large lounge type area. There are many couches with dust on them, a widescreen apparently LCD TV of approximately 60 plus inches in size dominates the wall in front of them with no power. A series of windows are open, allowing in sunlight at the far end to which the team proceeds and angles the camera outside. The view of the city is astonishing. This building is one of the tallest visible, but certainly not alone in its stature. The city below is gray and silent. No evidence of life at this altitude. Some buildings in the city have a strange brown growth that appears to have been splashed against them, as if a gelatinous mass was flung and then seeped down before hardening. Other buildings have floors where the glass has been shattered and the same brown substance is seeping out the edges. One member of the team calls the camera bearer to the window on the other side. From the other side of the building, the city edges can be seen. Attention is pointed towards an expressway that encircles the city upon which crawls another of the large half-body humanoids, dragging itself with its elastic arms as witnessed in previous tests. It travels the highway, then moves out of sight. The team returns to the elevator and notes that a button has already been activated for floor 74. No one has approached the elevator, so the team agrees to travel to this floor. On the 74th floor, the doors open and reveal a waiting area to what appears to be a doctor's office. At the reception desk, there is a sign-in sheet with a series of names and dates. The dates on the sign-in sheet all carry the year 1953. A PC at the receptionist area is on and functioning as a user desktop. The background for this PC is a large set of praying hands with the words Faithful OS under them. On the desktop are a series of folders with years on them, containing files that, when clicked using the center button of the mouse, open to a word viewer. All files appear to be appointment information. On the desk is a notepad titled, From the Desk of Dr. Borisizky blessed purificationist. 
The door to the doctor's area is sketched with the same name and title as well as a crucifix. Opening this door leads to a white, dust-free hallway that has two examination rooms and a key-coded door at the end. The examination rooms are unremarkable and typical of any doctor's office. All medicine cabinets are empty. A small amount of C4 is placed at the lock to the key-coded door at the request of control and then blown, forcing the door open. The area it opens into is much larger than the reception area itself and seems to contain a series of large containment capsules. There are a total of six of these capsules. Two are broken and a brownish amber material coats the floor coming from them. One is empty. The last three have nude humans floating in them with breathing masks. Attached to the front of these tubes are medical charts showing vital signs and conditions. For symptoms, the charts explain in somewhat awkward English ailments that seem more like flaws of personality or character, or just incidents that have occurred with the patient. Control asks for a zoom of one of the patient's pages on the chart. After focusing, it reads, Citizen Jennifer McZirka did suffer a lapse of heart that did lead her to lay with her neighbor twice upon nights of her husband's departure from their home. Patient did submit herself into the Lord's and our hands for cleansing of mind and body. Prayer administered by High Father Uwalakin, and patient submitted to a three-day period in the Lord's tears to cleanse her system, then released in good spirits. The topmost page reads, Citizen Alberius Farafon struck out at a high father during a sermon, blaspheming that the Lord's tears did turn his daughter to be unright in mind and heart, thusly laying blame for her whorish activities at the feet of the high father and his blessing. With no proof of these blasphemings, the forgiving judge and the punishing judge did agree that Alberius Farafon should bathe in the Lord's tears himself for a week to be cleansed of mind and soul thus to prove his daughter's ways are fault of not the father's hands and to give him peace of self. Subject, who has been traveling quietly with the escort team, now begins to panic. The camera pans to focus on him and he is surrounded by entities, similar to those witnessed in the first two tests. Escort team reports in that Subject is having a panic attack, but Control requests them to stand still and wait. Subject screams at the entities, which are denied to exist by Team Commander, stating Subject is alone in the corner. Control requests that one team member be dispatched to approach and recover Subject. The escort team member approaches the Subject as ordered. On the video, the figures part to make a pathway for the approaching member who lifts Subject to his feet and brings him out of the corner. Figures on video are then seen closing ranks to close the path. Subject is lifted to his feet by an arm and escorted through the figures that close their ranks when the subject is moved. They remain steadfastly staring at the subject no matter where he moves to. Control requests the team to return now. Team turns to leave. Before leaving, a team member mentions something noticed at the reception desk, a binder labeled The Lord's Tears. Control requests the binder be returned as well, and it is stowed into Subject's field kit. The team returns to the elevator and returns to the ground floor. Upon leaving the building, Subject points down the street towards direction of entry point. The camera pans to a section of raised expressway, across which one of the large torsos is crawling slowly. The entity turns its featureless face to look at the escort team raises its head to the sky, and emits a bellowing sound. Team leader issues the order to move, heading for the spot marked by the wireless video receiver. The creature on the expressway extends an arm down that stretches to touch the ground before the camera moves to the port. All team members, save one, move through entry point. Subject moves through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 is dropped by subject, who panics and tries to fight his way out of the room. Subject is terminated by Team Leader after he draws the field kit pistol. Team Leader requests Portal be reopened, but it takes several minutes to find someone who can hold SCP-093 and generate a similar color. When a matching color is displayed and applied to the mirror, the video receiver is visible and all individuals report a horrific smell. 
team leader moves through the entryway with control person, the uniform and possessions of the escort team member who is left behind are present and recovered, but the member himself is nowhere to be seen and does not respond to shouts. Member assumed KIA and wireless receiver recovered. Control and escort move through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. Later review of the recovered camera shows escort member <coughs> grasping at the air where entry point should be and then turning to look up at the oversized torso. A brown gel seems to drip off the creature as it moves that disappears shortly after being dislodged as if evaporating. Several shots are fired at the creature's face with the automatic weapons carried by <coughs> that land in the face of the creature, causing a spray of less viscous brown liquid to pour forth from the wounds. <coughs> Screams obscenities as the face of the creature descends upon him and the camera is pushed to the ground. Camera feed remains dark for approximately 65 seconds before light comes back and the camera films the creature crawling back to the expressway and pulling itself onto it, then crawling in the direction it was originally headed. <coughs> believed to have been absorbed by the creature and perhaps digested. This may have been an example of how these unknown entities feed by direct contact with living material. Further study is recommended to be avoided on this issue. Returned ledger filed as the, <coughs> the next test is classified as the yellow test. <coughs>